Hello, please pay attention as the world is about to end as you have reached a fateful continuation of what we, not a Robert unfortunately, he got shrunk for saying otherwise, like to call Master Month. The month where we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Time Lord known as the Master. So let's go back to the story that introduced him. It's time to see the world end from the terror of the Autons. So, 1970, Doctor Who is back with success after Season 7 reintroduced the show into the new decade. However, Derek Sherwin, the man who was responsible, had been shunted to a new show which led Barry Letts to come in and carry on with the new reinvention with script editor Terence Dix. Along with this, Caroline Trump had left, which meant the Doctor was out a companion. Joe Grant was introduced, played by Katie Manning, but Season 8 was also to bring a recurring villain to the mix, which was to be the Master, played by Roger Delgado, a rival Time Lord who was to be the Moriarty to the Doctor Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and the Nestings were brought back because they were being proven popular, which meant Robert Holmes, the writer of Spear Heaven and Space, was also brought back too. Now, that out of the way, let's go to what I liked about this story. John Pertwee is still at it again. By now, he's had a season that he's really settled in as the Doctor by this point. This story has some great moments to add to his Doctor, such as the ham-fisted bun vendor line he admits in Part 1, along with his save of the Master's Trap at the beginning of Part 2, to his confrontation with the Master at the end of the story. With the introduction of the Master, the Doctor seems to grow as he's now faced with an equal who can counteract him wherever he wants, and this is something that his incarnation will have to his very last season. Katie Manning does a good job as Joe Grant in the introduction story. I may not like her as much as her predecessor, but the character of Joe goes through a lot through the story, which helps Katie play her well. I do think that it was a bit of a bad choice for the writers to have her captured and suffer under hypnosis under the master, even though it does make for an effectful cliffhanger for part one with the bomb inside unit. But I'm glad that Joe was able to carry on past the story and the season to become so legendary in the years afterward. Nicholas Courtney is great as always. Like John Pertwee as the Doctor before him, at this point the Brigadier was now a regular of the show and, well, this was one of the stories where we remember him so well for, as he takes his control into unit very well, especially when it comes to rescuing the Doctor and Joe in part 3 from the Auton attack. By this same part, he's firing on all cylinders to rally the troops to stop the Master and the nesting consciousness. Unit itself has grown with the regulars of the season of Captain Mikey 8 as he introduced the story, who is a nice cooperative for the Brigadier in his scenes. Now, of course, we have have to talk about the one, the only, Roger Delgado as the master. Honestly, he has a great introduction with him and his plans with the plastic factory. Even when his plans seem to fill around him due to the Doctor, he never overacts with displeasure but instead has a feeling of personal success that someone is finally playing his game, taking in the attended Sherlock vs Moriarty inspiration to hand. Also, his theme is very haunting, although the amount of times they play the theme in the episodes is a bit too much. It's mostly when it comes to mentioning his name which I think probably would have been more effective if they hadn't have done it every time they mentioned his name. Robert Holmes is the returning writer, and the end product of the story feels like a story of his. I mentioned before that he had the position of having to introduce a few new elements and bring him back a returning one, which is something he didn't like to do, but with terror, most of the elements work to produce a great story by itself, and weirdly enough, despite it being a bit of a pseudo-sequel to Spearhead from Space, none of it really feels the same. Firstly, the Autons and the Nesting Consciences really feel like they're playing second fiddle to the Master here. They may be prominent to the story of how the Master is able to almost kill the Doctor numerous times, but it's only by the last episode where they actually make their mark onto the plot, where they underhand the Master for being a failure in their plans. Like for Spearhead, the Autons aren't very terrifying, with the exception of the cliffhanger, which I'll discuss in a different section of the video here. I mean, the disguises at the end of the story are scary to an extent, but the Auton face sculpt isn't as convincing as the previous one, which looks more like a plastic dummy that could be found in a shop. While well, this one looks a bit cheap, what doesn't help them this time is also that they're given a very generic, moderated voice, similar to the Daleks, that makes them feel more alien than human, which reduces the fact that they're supposed to be hard to spot due to them being easy to bend in the background 
background because they look so human. Next thing is a bit of a bugbear. Why is there a Time Lord who looks like he's trying to cosplay as Mr. Steed from the Avengers TV show? He was appearing to turn to give some information to the Doctor when at this point the Doctor is being put on punishment by the same people. I mean it's good that we have some information on the Master but I think if the story needed an explanation it should have been done via the TARDIS as the Doctor is obsessed with trying to use it throughout the story. It's not exactly breaking the rules of his punishment if he researches the Master to help him throughout the story. Another thing has to do with the CSO that's used in this story. If you don't know what I mean, CSO is actually the acronym for Color Separation Overlay, which is actually another term for chroma keying. Now, the CSO is used to represent a museum, the outside of a telescope, a lunchbox interior, a lab, an interior of two cars, and the coach, a phone box, a kitchen, a quarry, and everywhere the killer doll goes. Now that is a lot, and to be honest, a lot of these locations should have been built, or others could have been refurbished to show the real locations because CSO doesn't make these scenes work too well if they've been added on, as it makes you feel like the scenes have more of a staged fakeness to them. The killer doll scene should have been done in a way as the live action parts of the scenes where the doll moves doesn't work too well with the dodgy CSO backdrops. If those scenes had been done in stop motion, then I probably wouldn't have the problems I would do in these scenes in particular. One of the other things I don't like about the story was the Doctor being unnecessary mean to Joe in the beginning of the story. I know she was replacing this show at this time on screen and on the show, but it does feel ever so off that he would dismiss her because she isn't as capable as Liz was, as he finds out during the story of Joe's strengths rather than focuses on her weaknesses, which in his right mind, due to him being flippant of him trying to replace her at the beginning of the story, she gets captured by the Master and almost blows up a unit in the process just to prove the Doctor is wrong. Finally, my last point has come to ask him why the master had to use the circus as his cover when it ends up not really being needed in the end. Wouldn't it have been easier for him just to station himself in the plastic factory car park as it would have saved him more time than having to spread his tracks out to place himself and his talents in a separate place? Right, it's time to get to my favourite scene in the story, and this time it's the interaction of the Doctor and the Master in part 4. After both Time Lords have effectively been at each other's throats with every attack that the Master had done of the story, and every time the Doctor has fought at him, the two have found themselves more closer than before, and now they meet, and they're not fighting, they're not shooting at each other to kill each other, it's the Master giving the Doctor that one last chance of living. I mean, Joe's has slightly ruined it, but that's the point. She's there to give the Master that chance to, as he says, to let them live a little while longer. It's a fantastic scene and I think it's great in a part that it's all about great expectations. My favourite cliffhanger of this story has to be the one that covers from part 2 to part 3. Beginning with the cliffhanger that the Doctor and Joe narrowly escaped from, from the circus, in which both of them were nearly beaten to death in the previous part, they find out that the policemen that were driving them away are actually Autons. This is probably the only proper time I think the Autons are properly scary, as they don't see anything and don't give themselves away by any means, even with the fact that they have the silly modulated voices of theirs in this story. It's effective as well. In a bit of some real world trivia, the scene actually caused some controversy as the government at the time thought it'd be too scary for kids and would cause fear in people trusting the police officers. Still, that's what makes it so effective, the fact that something real could heavens forbid become alien. My favourite episode of the story is part 3. Coming off a somewhat less than good episode from the second part, the cliffhanger I mentioned before starts off the episode and the scene that follows it starts off very creepy before unit turn up and this is where things ramp up in the action. As the brig plans for a planning attack that will happen in the next part, the master dons his first disguise as the telephone man, played by Norman Stanley, the only time that the master's disguises are actually played by a different person, who places a new telephone which leads into a stellar cliffhanger where the telephone wire strangled the doctor. All in all, it's some exciting stuff. Now, since this is Master Month and the 50th anniversary of the character, I wanted to ask if this story still holds up as a Master story in general. And, well, the answer is yes it does. And I mean, of course it would. If this story had failed, I don't think the character could have grown to be ever so popular in his own right. When people think of Roger as Master, some of the moments from the story pop up. It's not only become a great story in its own right, but it's become the template for not only the rest of the Pertwee and Delgado Master stories that happened after this one, but it's sort of inspired the John Sim and David Tennant rivalry which happened in the series 3 finale as well. Looking at the sound of the drums, you can tell which parts have been used to be represented 30 years on, which shows the longevity of the story and how good it really is. Hold on, before I end this video, there is actually one thing I haven't discussed, and that's the direction. But the thing is, I don't actually know who directed this story. So, who did it? 
oh, it was Barry Letts. Well, I, I mean, I can't say anything bad about the person who directed one of my favourite second Doctor stories now, can I? So, Turn of the Autons then. It's not perfect, but it's a great adventure that began great legacies throughout the rest of the show. It's a classic that must be seen again. I'm glad the story brought us forward in the Pertwee era, a year into the 70s. The introduction of a brand new mischievous villain, the introduction of one of the classic companions, the return of something familiar could bring out something quite so good. Anyways, I think I'll leave you with that. See you on next- wait a minute. Hold on. This review seems awfully familiar. Wait, did I just base this one on the one I did for-